peki ba kwa 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 se ma anhe a sofu yina beti wabo tight so see offertries prosperity preaching uku dia grow hwa sofu biya biti ma buwe pra wu na uye na doctor demi na atina siye hunu se no san se mwa na wamo ke kano wamba bo nti ya mechire mwa enye papa because wano siye sofu wo a obiti mi edisa wanko mwoni bi na adeno ni di ondi na okasa editia wasi kristu ni ini kwa su utuya tight na kristu ni kwenye kwa su utuya sika biya basa basa ni emu mwono obiti mefri wakume mna wayi bibi edi ama obiya osu wo kenya nko pwansem seme miti wea me mintu ya taiti mintu ya huye mwa sofu biye miti mwa sofu bi nana huye mwobo msi uji wei fatu ubutu mi ana mefri mwakume mdi ache ni pakoro saame wopeso wachile se enune oso na se wuko tuya sika abraibu nyanko pwono se onje msa abraibu ino wanye bibi mfama wano Dr. Demina se, ini chulo kunkunu biye mu. E, ube timidu wa jen chila ba. Yungu ti yin se mwa wokan. Me si di wokan o, e yen o kore. Ana se, e yen tro. Kwa shi yami bu sa. Ok, now, so, is it correct to describe Abel Damina's mission as one which set out on a certain doctrine and has now shifted doctrine? Is it correct to say that? No, it's not because revelation knowledge is progressive. Ok, so, um, I have a mandate to reintroduce Jesus to this generation. Reintroduce? Yep. Why reintroduce? Reintroduce because the gospel of Christ has been so mixed. So many people in churches don't even know what the gospel is. So many in churches don't know who Christ is. They know steps to success. They know keys to financial prosperity, but they don't know Christ. Many in churches. You mean Christ and him crucified? Yep. We have been told that. The crucified We've been Christ. told about Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. The first love. Mm -hmm. And uh, born again. Yes. Yes. And the fivefold uh, ministry and the yes. great commission. Yes. All of these are fundamental teachings of the you know new that. charismatic era. You know that. Yeah. Many people but like me also know that. Why a lot of people don't? Because I interact. I travel a lot. And I can tell you so many people in churches today. And they don't? They don't know These what, fundamental things. Yes. They don't. And what do they know? They know steps to success, Prosperity. keys to breakthrough, how to get your money multiplied, how to make it in life. Miracle, miracle, miracle. That's the answer. So you're saying that in addition to the prosperity gospel, we should also teach the original gospel? Is no, that... there's no addition. It's either the gospel of Christ or not the gospel at all. The gospel of Christ which excludes the prosperity message? Well, prosperity is not the gospel. Christ is the gospel. Absolutely, yes. But doesn't Christ have derivatives out of Christ? Well, out of having Christ? Don't you get well, something else? Christ didn't come to make us rich. His mission statement, Matthew 121, She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, he shall save his people from their sins. Before Jesus came, people were rich. Before Jesus came, people were wealthy. Before Jesus came, people were successful. So that's not his mission. He came to cure what human beings have no solution to, which is sin. Man sinned, man must die, and man does not have the wherewithal to free himself from the malady he has brought on himself. But God loves man. The wages of sin is death. Man has sinned, man has died. Man is separated from God. Man is in a state where he's hopeless, helpless. God looked at the planet, and he discovered that all the gold mines of Ghana couldn't pay for man's sins. The oil wells of the Niger Delta in Nigeria couldn't pay for man's sin. All the treasures on the earth. So God Almighty, because he loves man, became a man to die on the behalf of man, to save man from his sins. So that's why Jesus came. Yes. The, all, all and that's the gospel. Correct. Once you get born again, you have a life to live, don't you? You have a life to live before you're born again. Yes. And you have a life to, to continue, continue living, living after, after you're, you're born, born again. again. Now, that life, that's you live with Christ. Yes. So Christ is in you. Yes. Christ is in you when you go to court as a lawyer. Yes. Christ is in you when you go to build as an engineer. Yes. Christ is in you when you go to work as a doctor. Yes. Christ in you, which they say is the hope of glory. Yes. Is that able to make you a better lawyer? The Christ in you. What makes you a better lawyer is the school you attended and the courses you did and how skillful you were with your lectures in school. You agree with me. The schools you attended, the people who wrote the books you read in your law classes or your medical classes, some of them are not even Christians. But yes, yet but you Christ, have to study Christ has that. all that knowledge. Christ has all that knowledge. Is he able to share but some of that knowledge with you? That's not his mission. Whilst, his it's, mission. whilst it's not his mission, once you have taken Christ into your life, as the central figure force 
that drives my life. Yes. But I'm a doctor. Yes. Is Christ able to reveal to me by the power of revelation things that can make me a better doctor? Well, Christ is able to give you directions by his spirit as to choices to make, what to do, what not to do, where to be. But when it comes to the intellectual, it will depend on how studious you were, how committed you were. That's why some of the successful people are not Christians. No, that, they don't have the Holy Spirit. I, I hear, I hear I'm, you I'm say talking that. about in the yes, I hear you say that yeah. people are successful. But the Bible seems to have made provision for that. When it says that the Lord your God maketh rich and he added no sorrow. It suggests that there's another rich. Well, the riches the Bible talks about in the New Testament are the riches of his grace. The riches of his glory. The riches of his mercy. He's not talking about material things. The riches what? he spoke about in the Old Testament. Yes, that because he made the Abraham Old rich. Testament is types, shadows, promises, and prophecies. Which means there was a communication in the Old Testament that requires a New Testament revelation of what was being communicated in types, shadows, prophecies, and promises. God says so when he will God bless, said, I'll make Abraham rich. He will bless Abraham. Yes. Okay. The blessing of Abraham is the forgiveness of sins. Abraham was already rich. He was already rich before he left his father's house. Abraham Genesis chapter 12. Rich. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was already rich. He had a lot of people who followed him when he left to go, you know, to go on the mission God called him. So he didn't follow God to be rich because he was already rich. I'm not sure about he was already rich. Oh, he was. Didn't, didn't, didn't I can prove it to you. Genesis chapter 12. Mm -hmm. It's right there. Abraham he was, was rich already rich. In cattle, silver, in gold, and man servants, maid servants, before God called him. That's why him and Lot had a quarrel because they had too much wealth in the land. So it wasn't following God that made Abraham rich. Abraham was already rich. He didn't follow God to be what rich. What made David rich? David was a king. No, and as before a, he became a king. Before David became a king, he was a poor shepherd boy. No. He was a poor shepherd boy. Yes, he was a shepherd boy. And then between the, the house time, of Jesse. Yeah, be, between the time he killed Goliath and the time he became king, he was not rich. He wasn't. He only became rich as king in Israel. Three times he was anointed to be king over the, 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 the province over the state and over the nation. The wealth of David was because he was king in Israel. So, and as a king, so it's natural God for God does wealthy. not make people rich. God doesn't make you rich, but God has provided a planet where wealth is available for the Christians and the non-Christians. And we have a level playing ground. We go to the same schools and we observe the same laws that govern commerce industry, investment in the society. Those laws, if they are taught in church, you find that wrong. Well, those laws shouldn't be taught in church because the church has a message. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth, the mainstay where Christ and Christ alone is dispensed. So the Bible does not contain truth that can make a Christian prosperous. It the Bible contain... does not contain truth that can make you financially rich. No, prosperous. I mean, I mean, I use the word prosperous. Well, prosperous. Does the Bible contain there. truths that can make a Christian prosperous? Well, the Bible contains principles that can make you prosperous in your relationship with God. Listen carefully. What Christ has provided, only men in Christ can access it. Those outside Christ cannot access the blessings that are in Christ. Ephesians chapter, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Meaning anybody not in Christ can't access it. Mm -hmm. Which means money is not part of the blessing because unbelievers, non-Christians, pagans access money. Vehicles, houses are accessed by every human being. Yes. But there are blessings in Christ mm -hmm. that a non-child of God cannot access. What are those blessings? Can those blessings lead you to financial prosperity on earth? Again, the mission of Jesus is to save his people from their sins. You see, the problem with the church is, the church thinks that because you are in Christ, you can be automatically rich. But that's not true. That's why you went to school. Because there are two realms to this. As a human being, you've got to learn how to operate this world system. And as a child of God, you've got to learn how to walk in your relationship That information with God. that makes you prosperous, that you say is available, is the Spirit of God, through Christ, able to give that information to Christians because they are with Christ. The model for ministry and preaching and teaching is Jesus. Yes, correct. Did Jesus teach any principles of financial prosperity? No. Did Jesus teach any principles of secular success? No. Did he preach three and a half years? What was he preaching? 
He was preaching the forgiveness of sins and his kingdom. What is the kingdom? Did Jesus of raise money? Jesus didn't raise money. Did but Peter he, raise money? Peter didn't raise money, but, Peter did not but raise people money. gave to him. Peter did not raise money. With people gave to him. The people give to Jesus? People gave to Jesus. Who gave to Jesus? People. Some of them were not Christians. Yes, but who? He was examples. For example, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus gave. Did, did they record that Zacchaeus gave? Jesus spent time in Zacchaeus', Zacchaeus house. Zacchaeus' house, but they, they, Zacchaeus they, they didn't give to Zacchaeus Jesus. Gave he didn't give to Jesus, but he gave to people whom he has cheated. No, that's a different matter. I'm, okay. I'm talking about the, 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 the Jesus model. Did he receive money? Oh, yes. They gave to him. Did he raise the money? Well, he didn't raise the money. Some people say he did. Well, they, they need to show me in the Bible. How do you know that he didn't raise? How do you show us that he did not raise money? Well, in the Bible, we're silent where the Bible is silent. We're loud where the Bible is loud. Did Peter raise money? Peter? Peter didn't raise money. What but was it, the story about Ananias and Sapphira? Ananias and Sapphira, there was a module in the New Testament church where everybody understood generosity. So in the church, people sold houses and lands and brought so that distribution can be made, the poor can be helped, and within the church, because generosity is the spirit of the New Testament. And Ananias and Sapphira... Generosity Sifira, including giving money? Yes. Giving arms? That's what it is, actually. Yeah. Generosity. So are giving Christians to expected to be generous? Oh, sure. But if you, are, you don't have money or you don't build the capacity of the Christian group as a pastor, as a church, to be able to access wealth through principles laid down in the Bible, like giving... If the church, how then are they able then to if then the give? church has to teach principles of prosperity, then our secular schools are useless. No, the church doesn't only teach principles of prosperity. The church preaches Jesus, but in Christ is all things. In Christ is all things that pertain to life and godliness. Yes. That's what I'm trying to enumerate. Yes. All things. If you read the scripture, the scriptures clearly spells out. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings mm -hmm. in the heavenly in Christ. What are the blessings? Number one, it says in the next verse, because the Bible is contextual. There's I get what you're saying, posters. but I understand that. I'm just trying to ask that. That is not to replace the prosperity gospel. That's not what I think the church there is, is no prosperity. They're not replacing no, there's the no, gospel. There's, there's no gospel. They are trying to tell the Christians that in Christ, you will have all things. Yes. Because Christ is the beginning and the end. Nothing was made that was made without him. So okay. because you have Christ, you would have all things. Therefore, you would have things that pertain to livelihood on earth, that facilitate your generosity, that facilitate your godliness. Mm -hmm. You will have all things, mm -hmm. health included, mm -hmm. wealth included, mm -hmm. peace included, mm -hmm. grace especially, yes. to be able to achieve all these things. No, but, but you say that, but take but, out some. But, Leave only this but grace, and expect the church to be generous. But grace, grace is not for material wealth. Grace is God's relationship with an undeserving sinner to provide the forgiveness of sin. Once you are forgiven and you enter the realm of forgiveness and therefore that you have obtained grace, are you able to then within that realm apply the resources of Christ towards prosperity on earth? Again, it's not only Christians who prosper. I get that. Good. So since it's not only Christians who prosper, God loves the world. God has created an enabling environment and put everything that humans require to flourish on the earth. And everyone, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, if you engage the principles, you make money. What is the role of the devil then? Can the devil frustrate these processes so that you will need a spiritual undertaking? to be able to bring back yourself on the even kill as a human being where God has provided and you can have access to it. Could there be a frustrating element from the institutionalization of the devil? Or what is your conceptualization well, again, of the role of the devil? Again, the Bible tells us the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Absolutely. So what the devil is after is to take people out of their relationship with God. That's the devil's number one task. Yes, correct. I agree okay. with that. And so whatever he needs to do, if he needs to attack the job of a believer, attack your health, attack your marriage. The whole intent is to get at your faith. Yes. Brother James will say, will say, the trying of your faith work at patience. So the trials target your faith. What the devil is That's after so, is your faith. So the devil comes after a Christian your individual faith. to attack your faith. Yes. In attacking your faith, he may attack anything, your yes. health, your resources. Anything. Yes. yes. So do you need to mount prayer against that force that you, the devil you, will bring. You resist the devil. The by, scripture tells you to resist what? him with words. With words. Mm -hmm. Jesus cast out devils by his words. 
Jesus, so, the devil so you, has been defeated. Yes. Two thousand years ago, Jesus disarmed principalities, disarmed power. So, so can the Put devil come against believer. the Christian's faith by making and affecting that Christian to be poor? Because when you are poor, your faith may be affected. Can the devil do that? He can if the believer is ignorant of his treasures in Christ. Ignorance is the devil's greatest weapon against the believer. Mm -hmm. Ignorance. My yeah. people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Yes. If the believer knows his authority, he knows who he is in Christ, the devil can do nothing if the, the believer that. knows who he is in Christ, then the devil cannot affect him by making him poor. He will continue to be rich because he will be able to resist the devil because he has knowledge. He will not be poor. He will not be rich because the devil is not affecting his finances. He will be rich because he is doing the, the needful in the secular to make wealth. Yes, but he has knowledge to resist the devil. Yes. You need knowledge to do a that. A believer can have knowledge to resist the devil, yeah. but doesn't have the skills to do well in business. Those skills, can you achieve them by using principles in the Bible? No. There's no principle in the Bible that None. can help you achieve wealth. None. And this is how to look at it. What messages were preached in the early church from the day of Pentecost upwards? That gives you an idea of what should be preached in the church. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, what did Peter preach? Christ died, was buried, on the third day he rose. Chapter 3, what did Peter preach? Christ died, was buried, on the third day he rose. What was the third sermon in the early church? Acts chapter 5, daily in the temple, they ceased not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. What was the message in... In Acts chapter 6 and 7, Stephen, Christ died, was buried, he rose. What was the seventh message in the New Testament? Acts 8, 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. Okay, so whilst the you message recognize that church, prosperity may be necessary, you think the church should never preach it out of the pulpit. The pulpit is sacred for the message of Christ alone. Outside the pulpit, if I am a church member of yours, a builder, and I come to you with a problem, can you advise me? outside the pulpit, that you need to take up these principles in the Bible to aid your professional Outside work. the pulpit, if you come for advice, if I'm skilled to advise you, I will. If I'm not, I will refer you to somebody that could counsel you in that profession and help you succeed. Let's talk about tithing then, uh, following from this conversation. You had used to be a believer in tithing. The general principle of tithing is that it is a commandment of God from the Bible. It was first done by Abraham to Melchizedek. It was expected to sustain and promote Abraham's wealth. It has been used by pastors to say that uh, the, the, the devourer will be rebuked for your sake. Did you say some of these things? <laughs> Did you used to say some of these things? Now, this is the foundation you need to understand about me. When I came into the ministry, I came into the ministry learning from those that were ahead of me. So whatever they taught, I taught. Whatever they did, I did. As a young pastor growing, I didn't check the Bible for myself. I just copied from what I saw them do. You didn't read the Bible? I read, but not with the lenses that I was supposed to read with. Because all I knew was what I was taught. But I grew in ministry. And then I looked at the book again, and I began to check some things. And I discovered some so of the things So you preached the pro-type message before? Oh, yes, I did. And you told people and to I bring their tithes to the church? very radically. And I asked people to pay their tithes. Did people come to complain to you in those days that they were paying their tithes and they were not seeing results? Oh, some of them. Myself, some inclusive. I was you, paying my tithes. And you were not seeing results? Yes, I was paying my tithes. When you say you're not seeing results, what does it mean? Again, so what is results? What's your definition of because results? Because it says, because the church has been told that if you pay your tithe, uh, you open the windows of heaven, you pour a blessing to you, you will not even have enough place but to But can I be it. honest with you? So many titers, 90% titers have room in their houses that has not been filled. So it's you mean 90% either... of titers have not received that blessing? They, they are, their houses are not filled to overflowing like Malachi promised. But that blessing of the tithe, is it only money? He said, rebuke the devourer for your sake. And That's he not will, money. He will give you blessings yes. that you will not have enough store. Yeah, but the rebuke of the devourer is not money. So but maybe you, don't you didn't see money. You don't need to tithe for the devourer to be rebuked. No, I'll come to that. What but I'm saying that the scripture that they have used contains that Malachi this information. 3. Yes, that Malachi it contains 3. that but information. But again, it's good to clarify. Yeah. Who was Malachi 3 addressed to? Tell us. It was not addressed to believers. It was addressed to priests, pastors who are collecting tithe and are not paying tithe. So Malachi said to those pastors, you have robbed me. Yes. People pay you tithe. You are not tithing the tithe. To who? The priests were to pay tithe to senior priests. So that's uh, biblical? Yes, biblical. Priests to pay tithe yes. to senior priests. In the, in the law. In the law of Moses, yes. So 
and in they the were law taking of Moses, the tithes from the, the law people, of Moses, and they the were taking the tithes from the people. Yes. But they were not paying their the priesthood was restricted to a certain tribe. The Levites. Yeah, the Levites yes. in the law. So this is about the Levites. Yes. So it's about the, the you are saying Malachi 3. It's uh, addressed to the Levites. It's about addressed to the Levites who were not tightened. Yes, not to believers. Not to believers. Yes. But you in, in the context that you explain, you already have found that believers were tightened. To, you said the believers the tied to the priest and the priests were not tightened. Exactly. So the Bible had recognized the believers tightened. Yes. And the believers were tightened as according to the law. Yes. Okay. Has that law changed? But you need to also know that there are three tithes. Before I come to three tithes, let's stay with this one. Okay. You the law has changed. You are explaining to us yes. that Malachi okay. is not about believers. Yes. So the law it's has about, changed. So, so that law. It has changed. By which the believers were tightened to the priest. It has changed. It has changed? Yes. Who changed it? Hebrews chapter 7. I can read it for you. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 7 changed Malachi. Yes. Hebrews chapter 7. Okay. What did he say? He said because there is a change of the law, there is also a change of the priesthood. But Jesus Christ said he has not come to change the law, but to fulfill it. What's the meaning now, of fulfill? Now, Jesus and Hebrew, no, the question who is, should we take? So the question is, what's the meaning of the word fulfill? Because the Bible is not an English book. It has its own language. So what's where is it coming from? Fulfill. Where's the fulfill coming from? He says, okay. I have not so come the to word fulfill change the law. It's not your English fulfill. What is it? The word fulfilled here is, I am not come to destroy the law, Matthew 5, 17. Yes. But to satisfy the demands of the law. That's the word fulfilled. How is that different from fulfilled oh, it's different. in the context it's of different. not changing something? It's different. Mm -hmm. Because to fulfill the demands of the law means the law demanded something in the Old Testament that nobody could, could satisfy. So Jesus Righteousness. Came, is it no, righteousness you're talking about? Yes, righteousness The law demanded works, righteousness, righteousness that couldn't works, satisfy. Yeah. And nobody could meet the, the, the works that were required by the law. Yes. So Jesus came, met all the demands satisfied the law and took the law out of the way. Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Absolutely. To everyone who believes. So how? So he took the law. So which of, which the, of the laws did he change? All of it? He changed all the law. All the laws of Moses. 612 of So them. obey thy father, thy mother and father and your days may be long. That's Has been replaced law. with what? That's not the law. What's Honor your father and mother is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are different from the laws. What is the law? The law of Moses was 612. The Ten Commandments were only 10. When Jesus says, I have come to fulfill the, the law, law, he's referring law to Moses, 600. 600. He's not referring to Ten Commandments. To the Ten Commandments. So Ten Commandments didn't change. They didn't change. That's confusing. Because the Ten well, Commandments... How do you lead me to that path? That Jesus says, I've come to change, uh, fulfill the law. The law he refers to is not Ten Commandments. Uh -uh. It's, so where is it written? That <laughs> it's this law that Jesus refers to is yeah. 613 laws of Moses yes. and not the Ten Commandments. Yes. Where is because it written? Because in the New Testament, which is actually the interpretation of the Old Testament. Old Testament, Jesus concealed. New Testament, Jesus revealed. Old Testament, types, shadows, prophecies, promises. New Testament, types, shadows, prophecies, promises, fulfilled in the reality, which is Christ. Now, so when you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament has two things. The law of Moses, which is 613 laws, and has blessings and causes attached. The Ten Commandments, which were given by the angels on, mount, on, on the mountain, which does not have curses attached, only blessings. Jesus comes and talks about them in the New Testament, I mean in the Gospels, as two commandments. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. Yes. Which becomes the lifestyle of the believer in the New Testament. The love war. So Jesus amended the 613 into two. No, he didn't amend. Actually, he didn't amend. Okay? He abolished the 613 laws. Into two now. No, he abolished them. All of them. He took them out. You of haven't them. showed me where he said he's abolishing though. Oh, in the book of Hebrews again. Jesus said, I am in abolishing. In the book of Hebrews. Who wrote Hebrews? Now, who wrote Hebrews? Yes. We don't, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. So, why do you say... But who was the later written to? Why do believing you say Jews, non-believing Jews will be believing Jews. You don't know who Hebrews' letter was written to? It was written to believing Jews, non-believing Jews will be believing Jews. Okay, Why was enough. the book of Hebrews written? Now, what is written in Hebrews that suggests that Jesus said, I am abandoned? Hebrews chapter 8. What did he say? He says, he, says, he has taken away the old... Mm -hmm. that he may establish the new. That if the old covenant had been faultless, there would be no need for the new. But because finding fault with them, God said, I will take away the old covenant 
and I will give you the new. But covenant, was it with Moses or was it with Abraham? The old covenant started with Abraham. Yes. But Moses became a partaker of it, of course. Well, all of us have become partakers there. Therefore. We are not partakers of the old covenant. Now, so this we are old, partakers so the, of the, the new covenant. The written, in the, the, the Hebrews writing, which says the covenant, it should be referenced to Abraham because it was with Abraham that the word covenant was used, that God had a covenant with Abraham. It didn't quite say God had a covenant with Moses. He did. He had a covenant with yep. Moses. It says so. Yeah. Okay, so if then it says covenant in Hebrews. Why are you saying it's Moses, but it's not Abraham? Well, again, Moses was the person who amplified the old covenant because Moses was the one who gave the covenant to the children of Israel in the day when they left Egypt to the promised land, the which 600. is Exodus. 600 a and covenant. 12. The 612 laws uh -huh. are not the covenant. Yes. They are not the covenant. Yes, so, but the, the Hebrew says he has changed the old covenant. He didn't say the laws. Now, you see, this will require a lot of explanation. Okay, and I don't think we have the time because when it comes to doctrinal subjects, it takes time to interpret and explain. And we have to have scriptures. No, I, I think this is quite simple, Prophet. The word covenant is used. Jesus the says, word I've covenant, come to change the covenant. The, the word, no, you he said didn't he say, I've come to change the covenant. That's what you told me that he no, said no, in no. Hebrew. I said in the book of Hebrews, uh -huh. God took away the old covenant to establish the new one. How do you Hebrews know that? Hebrews chapter 8. It's right know? there. What did he say? What, what are the words? He says, this is the covenant that I will make with your Correct. fathers. So he used the word covenant. And what's the word covenant? Now the covenant he covenant made with there. our fathers was made with Abraham. The covenant And it has there. to do with the circumcision. So the covenant there is not your English covenant. And the covenant had nothing to do with the circumcision. The word covenant is the Hebrew word epangelia. Epangelia means a self-fulfilling promise. That is, God made a promise to Abraham that only God will fulfill. He didn't need Abraham to have any part in the fulfillment of that promise, epangelia. And that self-fulfilling promise... So the word God covenant made, used is not appropriate. It's not the English covenant. Is Bible covenant, which is Evangelia from the original. Fair enough. Which means How does it then refer promise. to Moses excluding Abraham? Well, he will refer to Moses excluding Abraham because Moses is the father of the law. The law was given by Moses. The law was given but by the, Moses. The scripture said covenant, it didn't say law. Well, again, you need to understand that under the old covenant where Moses operated, he gave laws under that covenant. So we should understand covenant in Hebrews to mean the law of Moses. No. Plus the promise of God. All of in that all of that context, context in all of that context, covenant. however, the Ten Commandments remain sacrosanct. That oh, hasn't they changed. They remain sacrosanct. They Where don't do you change. get that from? That's what the Bible teaches. That the Ten Commandments remain sacrosanct. Yes. But the law of Moses has yes, gone. That's why Paul in Ephesians will say to children, honor your father and mother, for this is the great commandment with a promise. Not with a curse. When Jesus Christ said, I have come to fulfill the law, he I've was come asked, to meet the demands of the law. Yes, when he said that, he was asked questions about the Ten Commandments. He wasn't asked questions about the law of Moses. No. He was asked questions about the like, man five. has done so. so no, no, so. no, no. That's, he was dealing with the law of Moses. He said, You have heard it has been said of old, mm -hmm. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's stuff. But I say... And these are all the law, not the Ten Commandments. These are the laws, yes. The Ten Commandments doesn't have thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, the Ten Commandments have thou shalt not commit yes, adultery. Yes, does, certainly but does. remember, the spirit of the Ten Commandments is love for God and love for your neighbor. So actually, the Ten Commandments is a love work. No, I'm confused. Ten Commandments has those things you listed. The, when Jesus said, has he, have you not been told... All the things Jesus listed are contained in the Ten Commandments. So the New Testament... You say that Jesus didn't t change the so Ten So the New Testament yeah. interprets the Old Testament. In the New Testament, which is the interpretation of the Old Testament, things are made clearer. The law is set apart from the Ten Commandments. The teaching of the Ten Commandments is a love work. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. Now, when I love you, I will steal from you. When I love you, no, we I will get, not be no, we get that. My point okay. here is, so the point Prophet, is, my point is, the distinction between the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments. Yes. You say, the law of Moses is gone. Yes. But the Ten Commandments is it's not, not gone. gone. Because, now, Jesus Christ is the one who said that I have come to fulfill the law. And when he said it, he was talking about Ten Commandments. No, he wasn't. Okay. I will say that he was talking about Ten Commandments because no, the wasn't. things that he predicted the statement, as you yourself have just said, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. All the thou shalt not, he said, when he was telling his audience that, you have heard that they said thou shalt not do X, Y, Z. Those X, Y, Z was a direct reference to the Ten Commandments. 
You say that those, he wasn't making those prohibitions, reference. those prohibitions, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, those prohibitions, you say, whilst I in the Ten Commandments, you say I also contain the law of Moses. But, but you see, the point is, you're asking me questions, and you're not giving me enough time to explain the answer. I just want to clarify. Ten Commandments, law of Moses. So for you to get Moses. clarity, I've got to explain. And let, I'll let me, all the time Let's bring explain you to one more, then we move to tight. Okay, so good. Old Testament, where we have the Ten Commandments and the law of Moses. So remember, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments were put in the Ark of the Covenant. When Moses gave the law, 613 laws, they were put outside the Ark of the Covenant. Outside the Ark of the Covenant, because that was Moses' law to the children of Israel. John chapter 1, verse 17. The law was given by Moses, but grace, which is truth, came by Jesus Christ. So there's a difference, clear-cut difference, between the Ten Commandments and the laws of Moses. The Ten Commandments have no curses. The law of Moses has curses attached. Deuteronomy 28 lists all the curses that come along with the law. So what Jesus came to fulfill was the law and take it out of the way. But we still have the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, which is our love war. That we should obey. Well, the obedience of the Ten Commandments is what Christ has done in the heart of the believer. The Bible says you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you have received. Philippians 2 says, work out your salvation. Verse 13 says, for it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So there's the outworking of Christ's life in the believer, which is reflected in the love walk. Okay, so Ten Commandments is two. Love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Two of them. Law of Moses, gone. Gone. Tight was in the law of Moses. Tight was in the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. So it's gone. Tithe is gone because in the New Testament church, there was no tithing. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20, he says that in the New Testament is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus himself being the cornerstone, which means Christianity is apostolic and historic, which means what Jesus never did, we're not supposed to do. What the apostles never did, we're not supposed to do. What they did, we're supposed to do because it's apostolic and historic. So, in the New Testament... Jesus never spoke in tongues. Or we take that from the apostles. Jesus never... But we take it from the apostles. Okay. So, we can do what Jesus did and what the apostles did. Okay. Come I, I'll come to that in yeah. a minute about that one. So, the titan has been taken out. The titan has been taken for out. For the reason that what? Is this unrighteous? But, no. For the reason that there's a legalism in it. That legalism is what Jesus took out. But there are lessons from the tithe. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 tells yeah, us. Well, well, I need to break that down. Yes. The legalism of the tithe is what has Jesus been taken took away. That if you don't pay the tithe, you don't you get this. You are under a curse. That if you don't do this, you don't get this. That, is that has been taken out. Whatever yes. the tithe provides, yes. you can get it without tithing. Whatever the tithe, sure, yes. you can get it from Whatever God. Whatever they told you, the without, promises that they gave you. You get it the, from God without tithe. Without tithe. You don't yes. need to tithe for that. Yes. Okay. However, if you tithe, there's nothing wrong with it. No, it, there's nothing wrong with the tithe. Okay. Nothing is wrong with tithing. tithing but you won't just, get anything out of it. Tithing is just ten percent now. So why yeah. do we tithe? Well, in, why in, in we my church, tithe? they talk about first fruits, which they call I'm the New Testament tithe. I'm coming to which can be more than ten. I'm coming to, to yeah. the first fruits yeah. now. So what is tithe? Tenth. If people under the blood, because that's the Moses law. Yes. That's so we Moses we we law. want to go beyond that. Now in the New Testament. We don't percent. There's no percentage for the believer. It's from your heart. But there's generosity. Yes. You give from your heart. As a man has proposed in his heart, so, so let him So give. you're saying don't ask congregation to give tithe, but encourage them to give to the church. Oh, sure. Those are the lessons from the tithe. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. What things we are taught are for. They were taught for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So the question will be this. What was the tithe used for? Yes. Number one, it was used to support the house of God. Correct. Number two, it was used to support the Levites. Yes. Number three, it was used to support the, the strangers, the yes. orphans, yes. and Correct. the widows. Still the same. So in the New mm. Testament, yes. why do we give? We give to support the work of God. Absolutely. Why do we give? We give to support the man of God. Yes. Why do we give? We give to support the poor, the widows, and the orphans in the church. Correct. But in the New Testament, there's no legalism attached to it. Moreover, if people under the blood of bulls and goats we're giving 10%. How much more a man under the blood of Christ? To give more. So generosity. That's what the first fruit Much comes more from. giving. No, the first fruit is not. So, so you're not against Titan after all, Bill Damien. No, I'm not. I don't. You see, let people not. 
Just but if you Google Abel Damina now, them they say you're against Let them not run away with social media hypes and bloggers who are looking for, for views and followings. Oh, I when see. When people listen to me, they need to go to my YouTube channel and get the complete message. I see. If people can just patiently follow what I teach, most of the impressions people have about me, they will throw it away. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. Because any, any Google search of Abel Damina will tell you that here's a man who's against titling. So I was surprised. Because bloggers who are looking for... For following and views, so are do, you have a, do you have a, a period in your church where they say it's tight in time? Bring your no, we don't have tight in our church. We ask people to give generously. So, how many and offerings do you take during the service? We give like we give like two offerings during the service, yes, during which the is the service. same for many churches. Yeah, two offerings. One offering is the offering we give in honor of the word of God to enable us to do more for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then the second offering are the offerings we give for bills to be paid, TV broadcast, radio, and all of that, basically. How does Abel Damina, a full-time pastor, get supported? I do business. Oh, you don't? The church doesn't pay you? No, the church doesn't pay me. And you, all our pastors... You, so you're not a full-time pastor then? I'm a full-time. How do you get time what to do full business? Full-time full full -time. is that you are committed no, only to developing the, the church. That's your innovation of the title full-time. But the Bible meaning of full-time does not mean you're jobless. Paul was a tent maker. He was full-time. Peter? Peter was a fisherman. He was Christ food. asked him to stop the fishing. No, no. He did. No. He said, come and I'll no. make you fishers of men. He never did. For sure. And Christ Peter asked Peter stopped. to stop. He no, did. No, no. He did. Peter he stopped. never stopped. When, when Jesus died, where was Peter? He when went back to his business. Yeah, because Jesus had died. When he came back he to the mission. He went back to the business yes, because the because business was still running. Well, he's a fisherman. He can always go back. Yes. But, but the period that he was with Jesus, he didn't work. Jesus never he worked asked for Jesus. Them. No, Jesus never asked them to stop their business. He said, stop and come and follow me. He was establishing priority. He also said, forsake wife. Yes. But Peter didn't leave his wife. How many wives did he have? One. How do you know? It's written in the Bible. That Peter had one wife? Yes, he had a wife. A wife? Did he say he had one wife? Well, he didn't specify one, but Peter was married. For sure, yes. That's we the know point. That. Okay. okay. And Jesus told him to forsake lands, houses, yeah, but, but, but brother, when Peter sister, came back to the mother, mission, after the Pentecost day, he didn't fish anymore. He focused on the word of God. No, he left to be no, in Rome. No, no. No. He spent his days in Rome, yes. far away from Judea. Yes, but, but, but Christ never asked them to close down their businesses. I think he did. No. He said, no. stop and no. follow me. No, no. He said, come and follow me. He said, stop. He said, come and follow me. I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, stop your businesses. No, God is not against a man doing of God that. Doing I, I know business. God is not against a man of God doing that. Yes, but the apostles that. appeared to be focused on their people. work. Yes, it doesn't stop your focus to go and have a job. When, when you're doing business, do you pray for God to make your business successful? When I do business, I do business by the rules of business. Do you pray for God to make your business successful? I, I ask the Holy Spirit to give me direction, direction. On, on choices to make. Do you, do you ask the Holy Spirit also to give you intuition? Or is it the same thing as direction? Direction, just direction. Yeah, so you pray for spiritual help. Yeah, because to aid I have, you to succeed I have in that your business. advantage of the leading of the spirit. Absolutely, that's the point I'm but coming that to. But so if take so, away my skills. So if I'm a doctor, that can I pray when I'm going to perform surgery? Oh, sure, you pray for God the sick. If I perform the surgery several times and I'm extremely successful, now published by all the journals, can I say when they ask me that, how do you do that? I say it is God. Oh, yes, you can. Because that will mean that God but has are, aided me yes. to be able to be a successful surgeon. Oh, sure. That will bring me money. Sure. So God has made me rich. Yes. There's no problem with that in for that Abel Damina. In that context, There's no of, problem in that that. context of your explanation, yes. But again, the secular man, the secular doctor, who does he have God to pray to? Who is very successful? Yes, there can be that. Nobody's doubting that. But I'm saying that my source of success always has to be God. I don't know oh, what yeah, his source of success is. Of his source of success can oh, sure. be his knowledge. There's, there's no it argue. can be his reading. No, there's no because arguing the Bible the says fact. some trust in chariots, there's but no we will trust in the name no of the Lord. There's no arguing that fact. There's no Why don't you tell fact. the church that? Who said I don't? But if you tell them that, that's a prosperity gospel. You're preaching right well, there. The, no, that's not the prosperity gospel. I think you're not getting the context of the prosperity gospel. Show the me. prosperity gospel is a transactionary gospel where you must bribe God for God to do anything for you. Where you must tap. Oh, I get it. That when you, you must say that, sow, those of you who are looking for children, you've got to give money. Can you pay? Exactly. That's the that's the. Oh, everyone recognizes that as wrong. That's the prosperity But I think every, everyone recognizes that as wrong. That's the prosperity Oh, I, I thought you meant the prosperity gospel was telling people that through Christ, you can be a better lawyer. No. The prosperity gospel is a transactionary gospel that presents a transactionary God that will not answer your prayer till you pay some money. That I, I, will not do something that, for that you. That one is condemned by all. 
No, it's not. Oh, I've heard that. Everybody, it's not condemned. I've heard all your, the Nigerian pastors. No, so no, you no, no, everybody no, talk no. about that. I'm more in Nigerian than you. Yeah, but we watch it on video these no. days. I've seen what you're talking about. They've I've seen what you're complaining if about. they have condemned Where, they, assuming Shepherd Bushiri comes to Zimbabwe and says that all those who want to make uh, money uh, of a uh, certain amount, even in Ghana, please yeah. bring. Even in well, Ghana, we had an, a personal experience. I can tell you that I, no, there no, are we, many churches. No, we in have Ghana. an experience. Let me. I, I wish we had phone lines open. They will have a lot of confirmation. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. People are selling people... rice. People are selling uh, 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 powder, o o o oil, anointing oil, and, and all, all kinds that. of yes, things. All that is to be That's transaction. But let me ask you about this example. This pastor comes to Ghana at a big chair meeting. He says there's a 24-hour miracle. He doesn't ask you how much you should pay. He says, out of your heart, commit something to God and believe that within 24 hours, the Lord will answer your prayer. Why can't God answer if he didn't give something? So that's Freely wrong. you have received. Freely give. That's the gospel. But he says give something. Everything that comes from God is freely giving. Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Everything that comes from Jesus is freely given. When did that start? Because God required Abraham to offer his son Isaac for sacrifice. But and because did, Abraham, did Abraham demonstrated that he's able to do that, but did Abraham, God elevated did him. Did Abraham actually offer Isaac? No, he didn't. But he was ready to do that. So that he was, demonstrated so, that he was ready to so do that. that. It was a certain commitment so, that he showed no, to God. That was a lesson in death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. That was a lesson in the fact that God will offer his son and raise him from the dead. That was not a lesson in giving. Okay. That was a lesson in the Bible is Christocentric. But Abraham, but Isaac was never killed to be raised. But you are saying that it is a it's a typology. It's a typology yes. for the resurrection of Christ. That's why in John 8 56, Jesus said, Abraham saw my days and was glad. Where did he see the days of Jesus? Mount Moriah. Where in the place of Isaac, an animal was killed. In my place, Jesus died. Okay. It was a type. So the pastor who says, out of your heart, give to God and believe that God would reward you for this giving. Not necessarily that he'll give you money. He may give you, devour for your sake, all of that. You think that is wrong? To ask to give for God to give you something. No, he didn't say ask for God to give. Out of your heart, whatever you want to give, give. And trust God that whatever you're believing him for. Don't tie it. Trust God that God will do what you want. Please. Not because you gave. Not because you gave. Whether you gave Once or you didn't you give. Once you bring that giving into that equation, you've messed up the principle. God gives without... God does not need mobilization. He's not a contractor. He doesn't need to be massaged. He's a father. Didn't God say in the Bible that name the man and he says because of his giving, he had a covenant with him? No. No, there was, there is, I'll show no. you. They're talking there, about Cornelius. Yes, Cornelius. Tell no. us the story of Cornelius. He was talking about Cornelius, Cornelius first yeah. of all. He said his giving had formed a memorial. A memorial. Yes. Because. Cornelius, correct. Yes, Cornelius. Yes. So what God did was he saw the heart of Cornelius. Let me read the scripture actually. It's what, Acts chapter it? 10. Acts chapter 10. Let me yes. grab it. Let me grab yeah. Acts chapter 10. Okay, so here is Acts chapter 10. There was a man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. He was a devout man and one that feared God with all his house and gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Three talks about a vision, but four is important. When he saw the vision and he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he, the Lord, said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. So, Arms giving can impress God. Is that also? Well, first of all, the book of Acts. What's the book of Acts? Mm -hmm. The book of Acts is not a doctrinal material. The book of Acts is eyewitness account. What Luke saw, the progression of the New Testament church from the law to the message of Christ. And he recorded how the church progressively moved from the law of Moses to the full message of the New Testament. So being an eyewitness account, you don't build doctrine on it. That's number one. Number two, you don't build Bible doctrine on single mention. This is single mention. It has no corroboration in the New Testament. No. What does that mean? At the mouth of two 
or three witnesses, a word is established. So you mean what was written about Cornelius, we can ignore it? Yes, because it's eyewitness account. But the Bible says everything in the Bible is written for our learning. Not everything. Is that what you, you, you said? It? No, I was talking about the Old Testament. Whatever things were written are for, referring to the Old Testament. Yes. They were written for our learning. So that we through patience. So why is the Cornelius experience documented? It is documented as eyewitness account. It's like a journalistic. No, but it is account. God speaking. No, it's not. No, it's the quotation says, and he said unto it's him. It's a journalistic account. It's like I observe something between you and somebody, and I'm reporting. No, but the person writing so you was not there when no, this happened. So you don't build a doctrine on that, because no. it doesn't have a corroboration. Fair enough. The person writing was not there. He wasn't there. How did he know? Well, the Holy Spirit must have revealed it to him. No, Dr. Luke wrote from what he saw. Was he there? Did he hear God telling Cornelius? He wasn't there. Yeah. But he spoke with the people who were eyewitnesses and he copied no, based on... No, the, the word says this God was, spoke no, to Cornelius. God didn't speak to Dr. Luke. No, yes, he spoke so to Cornelius. So for Luke to write this... The Holy Spirit must have, must have revealed no, it no, to him. He must have engaged people. He, he was, must have engaged he Cornelius. He engaged people who were eyewitnesses of these events. He said it in the beginning. This is not, this is not an no, event. No, let me read this it. is not an event. This is okay. Cornelius let me dreaming read, about something. Let me read Acts for you. Who was the book of Acts written to? It was written to Theophilus. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he has chosen. Watch this. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days. So it's what people saw and people told Luke that Luke documented. It wasn't God speaking to Luke directly. That's Clearly, why it wasn't you, God speaking to exactly. Luke. Exactly. So, so who told why, Luke? Somebody. Yes. Somebody Cornelius told. Yes. Told That Luke. God told me. Yes. The account was reported. But why did Luke him. believe it? Luke believed it because yes. it had... It, I mean, if you are a journalist and you ask from somebody that is credible and he tells you this is what it is, you will take it. Then, then the guiding principle of documenting in the Bible was that some of the things documented we can ignore. If they don't have a repetitive culture, if they don't have, if they then don't we have, cannot call it doctrine. Yes, because you can't build a doctrine on single mention. You build doctrine on double mention or emphatic mention. This was not emphatic. This was not doctrine. Emphatic means what? It may not emphatic be double. Emphatic means a, an entire chapter. A principle is emphasized and taught in full in a chapter of. But that is determined by the translators. Well, they will determine how many times they repeat something. No, they won't determine that. Again, remember that the word of God has a singular message. The singular message of the entire scriptures is Christ. Okay, so Cornelius, we should ignore it. Yes, arms giving. We shouldn't go it's, thinking that is you not, give arms uh -uh. and you pray and uh -uh. it will form a memorial before God, uh -uh. Be, it, as it was for Cornelius. Because it we shouldn't even, think it will be the yes, same for us. At all. Because it it even, that's shocking there. Yes, because it doesn't even have a mention in court doctrine. Court doctrine is Romans to Jude. There's no mention of arms giving as a prerequisite for the blessing. None. So whilst it is clearly in the Bible, we should ignore it. Yes, there are many things you ignore in the Bible. For example, Moses said God was trying to kill him. How can God be trying, be looking for how to kill Moses. That's an assumption. Moses yes. also said in Genesis 18. But that's an opinion. Yes. But that's not an opinion. That's an assumption. But this Moses is, says God is trying to kill me is an opinion. This is a report. Yes. From what people saw. You can't build a doctrine or eyewitness account. So you don't believe it? I believe it, but it does not form a practice principle for me as a believer. Therefore, what you're saying is, whilst you say arms giving may be good, we shouldn't think... It's not a basis. Yes, we shouldn't think basis. almsgiving will bring you any memorial no, before God. No, As it did for Cornelius. No, no, So it happened to Cornelius, but it may not happen to me. Yes. That's how we should see it. That's, that's, that's what the New Testament teaches. The New Testament doesn't emphasize almsgiving as a prerequisite for blessing from God. No, we understand that it being a prerequisite for blessing. That's a different conversation. But whether okay, it's so, good to do so, it or not is, yes. the, is, the, is the point I'm making. It, 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 as a human being... Because in I any mean, case... As a human you, being... You can't determine prerequisites. It's, it's a good thing to give arms. God will determine what no, he no, will do. No, you He says, I, the Lord, I do all things. No, no, no. So that you give... No, you can't say that. Once you say that, then we can throw away the Bible and just think whatever we want to think. Right. There's a borderline but the, to God what said God... He, he, he no, no, no. There's a borderline to what God does and what God does not do. This kind of thinking... No, I'm talking about what God can do. He can do all things. God cannot do all things in what the are, context of all things. What are some of the things he cannot do? God cannot steal. 
No, I'm not talking about God evil. cannot lie. Mm -hmm. All things will be all things. Yes, and God can. Well, God those are prohibitions. Cheat. No, those are prohibitions that is given by God. So clearly, he's a man so of his word. So there are things that God so, cannot. Yeah, so those things, are, it will only so, be the prohibitions. So when he says, Any other thing, God so when should he says be able to all do. things, mm -hmm. it must be all things in a context. Yes. So the context of the all things has to be checked. Mm -hmm. So when he says with God, all things are possible, what was the context? A woman was told she would carry a baby without the knowledge of a man. And she said, how can these things be seen? I know no man. Then he says, with God, all things, all things will be all these things in this context are possible. For example, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But you cannot do all things, even though you can do all things. So what's the pretext okay. and the post-text of that scripture? So paying tithe or offering or first fruits, as we call it, is not particularly wrong. It cannot be put in a legal context that until you pay, you will not get a certain blessing from God. That's really the point you're making. Well, again, the point I'm making is that take away the tithe, take away the first fruit, let people give generously. Don't give it a label. Let people, people are born of God. They so do we, when you, in your church, do you announce that it's time to give? Oh yes, when it's time to give, it's offering time. Do you because encourage them to give? We tell people to give and support what we do. So you encourage them to give? If there are projects, we announce and tell them everybody support it. Yeah, so you encourage them to give, but you don't put it in the context of it is called tithe or it is called first fruit. Yes. And, and it giving is, it will mean you will get not, something. It's not tied to any blessing. Yeah, it's not tied you to any blessing. You just give us a child of God who is responsible and wants to see the work of your father advance on the earth. But could you be blessed because you gave? No, no. you can't be blessed for giving. No, you won't be blessed because you gave. Yes. You'll be blessed anyway. You are blessed because So Christ, whether you give or not, you'll be you're blessed. You're already blessed. Okay. You're already blessed. It's because you are blessed that you give. Yes. You don't give to be blessed. Yes. But because you've been blessed in Christ, you give to support God. That is why when you have 100 Naira in your bag, because you believe you are blessed, you believe that you own 1,000 Naira, so you can give the 100, knowing that it's the last money in your wallet because you are blessed. Because you are blessed, that blessing will manifest. Is that not so? No. <laughs> no. Jesus said the poor you will always have. Yes, I know that. Okay. Yeah, but I'm so saying that. So the fact that you give doesn't mean you'll be free from poverty. Mm. You can give and still be poor. Very poor. That's a person the is poor. The churches in Macedonia yes. were in deep poverty. That the person is poor. Does that concern God? That the Christian church is poor? Does it concern God? God was concerned before you were poor. That's why He created a rich planet for you to engage and make money, agriculture technology medical so science. a church and a group of christians that are poor god will see it as they have themselves to blame yes because they are irresponsible and paul say he that does not work should not eat could it be the work of the devil to have made them poor no it's just foolishness it's not the work of the devil no it's foolishness all those who are poor are foolish they are foolish in the sense that they are not taking responsibility for their lives somebody's working he works in a bank in nigeria Salary and he's not doing not well, yeah, so he should poor. develop new set, uh, skill sets. You should stop the banking and develop new skill sets. Start developing new skill sets. Learn how set. to play football. You don't even have to stop the banking. You can go to school mm -hmm. online. You can just spend extra moments and develop new skill if sets. If you don't do that, you are foolish. Well, yeah, foolish in the sense that you're not taking responsibility for your life. What about the role of women in the church? I've, women? I, I know you've said a few things. Yes, because the Holy Spirit on the man is the Holy Spirit in the woman. The Holy Spirit in the man is the same Holy Spirit in the woman. There's no female Holy Spirit, no male Yes, Holy correct. Spirit. So what have you said about women in so the I'll church? So put my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. So women can play any role. Women can preach. Women can play any role because there's no male, no female in Christ Jesus. Is there somewhere they say women cannot preach in church? No. Within the Christian context? There's none. Okay, so that's a point that we all agree on. Yes. That the same Holy Spirit in man is the same Holy Spirit in yes. woman. And the Holy Spirit can fall upon a woman and he can preach. A woman will do wonders. What is a Bildamine's understanding of tongue speaking? Speaking in tongues is the language of the new creation given by the Spirit of God. Is it okay for us to say, let's start praying and then blah, 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 blah. Is it, is it okay? Is it good? Well, if you're born of God and you have the Spirit of God in you and what the expression that comes out of you is blah, 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 is good. Some say that tongues is only for interpretation. No. And it's not to be spoken by the, by it's the people. It's not true. Why? Because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, he that speaketh in tongues 
speaketh not to men, but unto God. How be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Then he says, if a man is speaking in tongues in public worship, and there's no interpretation, let him keep silent and pray within himself to God. But if he has interpretation, let him bring forth the interpretation that the body may be edified. So there's a place for personal prayer in tongues where you build up yourself. Jude 20, you build up yourself. And there's a place for tongues and interpretation in public worship for the edification. When you speak the Jude 20 tongues, what are you building yourself up for? Oh, the Bible says you rise higher and higher like an edifice. You in what? Grace? Faith? What? No, you build, just build up your faith, your most holy faith. So you rise above circumstances, you rise above challenges, you're empowered, your mind is totally charged, ideas begin to flow, concepts begin to flow, and an ability within you to see that what is before you is nothing. All that rises within you when you pray in the spirit. The um, rapture, which is something Christians are looking forward to, uh, is said to occur in the three and a half years after the arrival of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is expected after a period of many signs and wonders that have been discussed in revelations some of which have started um social media reports a buildamina are saying that there's there will be no rapture is that correct you know again don't follow social media <laughs> check me out on, check me out on youtube my teachers are all there in their full series for example my rapture series is about 40 hours you can't report a 40 hour teaching of two hours one hour 30 minutes in five lines on on the internet so what's my take on rapture? Yeah. Or what's the Bible take on rapture? Yeah. Rapture is not in the Bible. The whole Bible doesn't have the word rapture. So where the theologians get the word rapture from is from the resurrection of the dead. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together and we shall meet with the Lord in the new man, in the spirit. Is that not a story in Revelation 13, 14 where it says people got missing, they were looking for them and all of that? That that's going to happen? Well, again, rapture is not missing and disappearing. Rapture is resurrection from the dead. No, the rapture used in the Bible, or there's no rapture used? No word rapture in the entire Bible. In Revelations? There's none. None in the whole Bible. There's no word like rapture. What we have come rapture to know as rapture is Rapture is a coinage is by theologians to explain a concept of the resurrection of the dead. When does that occur? At the end of the world. When is the end of the world? When the trump of the Lord shall sound. Trump of the Lord sounds from where to whom? Well, the Spirit of God in every child of God will quicken the believer, and the believer will know that this is the time. And when that happens, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, we shall be changed. This body will be dropped and changed into immortal body. And that's after the that, end of after the world. that event, does the, the world continue? Is the end of the world. So what is the Antichrist? Antichrist is not a person. Antichrist is a belief system, yeah, system yeah. that resists the deity of Christ or the humanity of Christ or both the deity and the humanity of Christ. Yeah, but the, sisters, the scripture refers to an Antichrist as a man who, no. may, who will proclaim himself as no, Christ. No, it's not. And a, that he, has, he even has a number. It's not a man. You see, it's, it's, the, the belief system is in rich people. It's in men. So it's not man, it's men. Even in Thessalonians, he talks about the man of sin. If you go to the original text in the Greek, it's not man, it's men of sin. Because the belief system is in men that resist and oppose God and oppose Jesus as being God or Jesus as being a man. It's a belief system, it's a mindset. So it's not a political system of leadership? No, that's why the Antichrist is alive. They're, it's on right now. It's not a future thing, it's on right now. There are people who resist the deity of Christ or the humanity the of Bible Christ. The Bible clearly right says now. it is the number of a man those who have ears, let them hear. The book the of number the, is six hundred. The book of Revelation cannot be looked at literal because Revelation is a book of heavy metaphors. And the reason for the metaphors in the book of Revelation is because angels were attempting to reveal Christ to John at the island of Patmos. And angels don't really know Christ. Angels don't really know Christ. So in their bid to reveal Christ and the plan of God to John, they had to employ the use of heavy metaphors that requires interpretation from the doctrinal books of the Bible. So in interpreting Revelation, you need the other body of, of doctrinal material to interpret what Let is me read what it says about the 666, and then you can tell us oh, sure. what other doctrinal material needs to be added. Oh, okay. sure. Okay, so here's Revelation 13, 18. In describing what we have been told is the Antichrist, 
It says, let him have understanding, count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. The Antichrist is described as a beast with seven horns and all that, earlier in the Bible, earlier in the Revelation 13 or maybe 12. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. That's what it says. So again, it says the number of a man. Again, who wrote the book of Revelation? John. Yeah. So, Revelation is a book of heavy metaphors, which means it will rely on the epistle of John to interpret the metaphors in the book of Revelation. You can't, you can't, let, you can't interpret metaphors by metaphors. So the writer of Revelation will interpret what he's saying there in his epistle. So what does John say about Antichrist generally? What the Antichrist is? First John chapter 4, verse number 3. You are saying the same writer? Yes, same writer. He wrote Revelation. But the doctrinal book he wrote is the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which is doctrinal, which you will use in interpreting Revelation, which is metaphorical. Now, what does he say about Antichrist? He says, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. As so, at the time he was writing, he was yes. already in the world. As at the time he was writing. The spirit of the Antichrist yes. was already in the world. Yes. But the man of the Antichrist was not in the world. Exactly. So the point is, you cannot take man in Revelation and leave the metaphors. There's a code of interpreting the metaphors, which is the doctrinal book. And the doctrinal book tells you that Antichrist is a spirit. Where does the spirit find itself? In men. Yeah, but it's the same as the Jesus Christ. The same spirit that produced Jesus Christ, was a spirit that was there before Jesus Christ was born. But the spirit manifested no, itself no. in the man Jesus Christ. No, the point it doesn't mean the spirit started with Jesus Christ. The spirit, the Antichrist, is a mindset, is a belief now, From system. what you've read, it said it's a spirit. Yes. And that present. was already, and present. That, and he, he, he already further, present when John wrote this he about 5,000 years he ago. He further explained who is the Antichrist, but he that denied the deity of Christ. Yes, he says that person the carries humanity. the spirit of the Antichrist. He carries the spirit but of the But the physical Antichrist. manifestation of the Antichrist, as we have been told, the, the, physical, the, word manifestation Elohim of the, the physical manifestation of the the physical manifestation of Christ with no, men. No. Emmanuel made flesh with men. So the spirit of the Antichrist may, be, may have been there from First John 5,000 years ago, yes. but the physical manifestation of the Antichrist is what was predicted in Revelation. Is that not so? The physical manifestation of the Antichrist, therefore, is what we have today where men are rejecting the deity of Christ or the humanity. But we had it Christ. then. If he says it in, in It John, was there then and it is there till now. And there will be no physical manifestation there will of be that no spirit. Physical. There will be no one person called But Antichrist. why is he say he is a man because and he has a number? he is speaking in metaphorical language. If you follow the tone of how he is bringing... Why does he need to do again, that? Remember, why Reden, does he need to do that? Because in a vision, you don't have literals. In a vision, you have metaphors. For example, Peter is up He's praying and he sees a vision, four-footed beast. And then they, they told him to rise up, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, I cannot eat. There was no literal animal there. It was a communication to Peter that the Gentiles have not been accepted in the family of God. So, but metaphors It, it wasn't said when he eats pork. Yes. So if he eats pork, it was wrong. Well, if he, say, if he eats pork, it can't be wrong. But you're saying we shouldn't interpret the vision literal. of Peter literally. Literal, yes. And the vision has been interpreted literally by Christians to mean that all meat is wholesome. No. The point is, metaphors were used to communicate to Peter based on his mindset of the law of Moses. I get that. Okay. But he was now told, what God has cleaned, you shall no more call unclean. And that was in reference to Gentiles. Reference to Gentiles. Not in reference to meat. Not in reference to meat because meat But was it just means you meat. can also eat meat. Which means you can eat pork. As well. Yes, because the law is abolished. So why did John find the need to confuse us with the metaphor? He wasn't confused. And say that it is the number of a man. No, he wasn't confused. And he started by saying, those who have ears, let them hear. But remember, he was in a vision. Yes. The key doctrine in the book of Revelation are the letters to the seven churches. That's where the main message is. That's where you have the core message mm -hmm. of that book. All the rest are metaphors that will require interpretation from the epistles, which is the body of truth. And that's exactly what I So no rapture. Before. There's rapture. Rapture in the sense there's resurrection of the dead, where the mortality end. shall put on him. Shall Jesus come back to rule in Jerusalem, as it says in Revelations, or is that also a metaphor? Well, that one is a communication that requires interpretation. Jesus is not coming back to rule in Jerusalem. Rule from Jerusalem. He's not coming to rule from Jerusalem. What is he coming to do? 
He's coming to rapture his church. He's coming to take away his church. And this earth will be destroyed. And the heaven will be destroyed. That's what the Bible teaches. So when Revelation says that, so that the kingdom of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ, at which time will that happen? Where was the kingdom? The kingdom is the word Basilia. Basilia means the reign of Christ. It's in the heart of man. It's already on. The moment Jesus comes into your heart, he starts reigning in your heart. So the, the, the reference in Revelation is that so that the kingdoms of this world would become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's happening now. It's already on. The kingdoms are the hearts of men. That's what the devil offered Jesus at the temptation. And Jesus turned it down. So that the, the hearts of men, are which was, to Jesus which was for the which devil, where Satan was. is now becoming the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus yes. Christ. He's not referring to imperial kingdoms. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. Are Christians supposed to participate in politics? As a civic responsibility. No, I mean, put yourself up for political office. Yes. To run for president. If they want to. That's civic? That's civic. That's not, that's not God. Civic for you doesn't end at voting. You can put yourself up. Yes, if you want to run. You are a citizen. You have a right. You are a citizen of the country. You have a right to run. There's should you tell people that I'm a Christian so you should vote for me? If I want to. If yes. I want to run so for you tell people that I'm a Christian, so vote for me. No, I'm not going to say I'm a Christian. I'm going to say I'm a citizen of Nigeria and I can do well for Nigeria. Vote for me. I'm not going there on the label of a Christian. I'm going there as a citizen who is concerned about the state of my country and I want to do something about it. If a politician wanted Muslims to come to your church, should vote if, for if me. Bola Tinebu, the Nigerian president, wanted to come to your church the Sunday before the voting, would you host him in your church and not. would you allow him to address the church? I will not. I will let him come to church. I will preach. He will get blessed. And we all go home. He won't address the church. I'm not going to give him my mic. I won't. I'm a father. I have members of different political divides in my country. Assuming that, therefore, Peter Obi wants to come I'm as well. I'm not going to give him my mic. And uh, this other... I'm uh, not going to give him my mic. Wants to come as I've well. had so you don't give your platform to politicians? No, I've had them come to my church. What and about they, chiefs? Chiefs. Traditional authority. What, what will he say on the pulpit now? The pulpit is for the word of God now. <laughs> it's not his paramount seat. So you don't give the pulpit to anyone else? It's the pillar and ground of the truth. I give the pulpit to only one who has the word of God to dispense for the edification of the body of Christ. I will give him my pulpit. If he's the president of Nigeria, would you give him your pulpit? If he comes to our church, yeah. I will give him the pulpit as the father of the land to greet the church, but not for campaign. If he comes for campaign, I won't give him my pulpit. He won't tell you his campaign. He comes to speak as a father of the once, when there's, once it's a political coloration, I have sense enough to know that any politician looking for me at that time wants my pulpit for, for political relevance, and I'm not going to give him. It's not today. I've been preaching for over 30 the, years. The final one. How should Christians evaluate a pastor to determine whether he's a man of God or not? The Bible says somewhere that by their fruits you shall know them. But that's very broad. How should even by their fruits you shall know them, it's not talking about how to identify a pastor. The context of that was false prophets. How to know false prophets yes. by their fruits. Yes, so that's what, that's how, what, that's what know, I'm saying. How do you know a man of God? A man of God is one who labors in the teaching of this word. A preacher that cannot open the scriptures, expound, interpret, rightly divide is red flags. Only the word of God makes the division between darkness and light. So a man of God must be able to sit on this word. Because that's ministry. We will give ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. So how do I know a man of God? He's a dispenser of the rightly divided word of truth. Outside of that, red flags. Mm -hmm. Are there some red flags about pastors in Nigeria? About red flags? About pastors in Nigeria? There are quite a lot who are funny. <laughs> they are funny? <laughs> yeah, there are quite a lot who are funny. Including some senior ones? Yes, including both senior and down. There are quite some that are funny. <laughs> but you are laughing at them. No, I'm not laughing at them. I'm just laughing because of the way you're asking. <laughs> are there some pastors in Ghana that are funny too? Oh, sure. Every country has them. <laughs> Even in America. Give me one pastor in Ghana that you think we can rely on. Because I do not live in Ghana and I try not to mention names when I speak in public. What about but, in Nigeria? Where I you gave live? some indices. Same thing in Nigeria. So give us some indices in Ghana. What kind of pastor can we rely on? A man who teaches the word sound word, rightly divided. The, the message of A Christ. man who doesn't call for tight. No, you see, tight is not a sin. I've said it here. But legalism and transaction is not the Bible. But a man who calls for tithe as an obedience to the word, is wrong or right? No, if a pastor, if a pastor says, well, bring your tithe as an obedience, the work of God. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that the pastor is limiting his church. He's limiting the potential of the giving of the church to 10%. No, Many in my church, in my church we say first fruits. It's more than 10. 
Well, first fruit again in the Bible. You can even all. No, first fruit in the Bible is Jesus. It's no money. Yeah, I understand. But the concept that we say is that the Old Testament is the law. That's 10%. Limits you to the law. Do more that you may be out of the law and obtain the blessings outside the law, which is forgiveness, faith, freely given, etc., etc. No, but if you have to do something to obtain forgiveness, then it's legalism. No, no, it's not, it's not to obtain forgiveness, but just to benefit from the New Testament uh, model, which is the faith and the freedom that Christ has given. That if you pay the tithe under the law, you restrict yourself under the law. But, Therefore, but, if you are under the law, you will be under the law. But again, truly, you don't have to give anything to benefit from the New Testament. Last one, polygamy. Where does it sit? It's a non-essential. It's a non-essential. There what are essentials and there are non-essentials in the Bible. Yeah, but Christians have to govern their lives with these things. So, it's polygamy was a standard, wrong. Was a standard from the beginning, male and female. Yes. Husband and wife. Yes. Standard from the beginning. That you're talking about Adam. From the beginning. Gospel, beginning of what? Genesis 1 and 2. That's Adam. That's the beginning. So, You Abraham. will hear Jesus say it was not so in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that means there's a standard God set for man. So polygamy for you is wrong? Well, it depends. If a man had three wives before he got born again. No, a young man who is born again who wants to take another Filled wife. Filled with the spirit, taking two wives. Another wife. He has one, he wants to take another. Well, if he's in my church, I'm going to counsel him not to do it. Why not? Because. Is it a sin? It, it, could, it, it doesn't have to be a sin if the first wife agrees that he can have a second wife. Okay? It doesn't have to be a sin. But he's not an example in the house. But that's what the Bible says. That if you have two wives, you cannot be an elder. So it's not so, an example. So it's not a sin. It's not an example. Yeah, it's not an example. It's not a sin. So because it's not an example, every child of God ought to be an example. Well, but we all don't want to be elders in the church. No, you, you don't have to be an the elder. The Bible says if you want to be an elder, no, no, you no, must no. have one You wife. don't have to be an elder, but every child of God has a ministry to preach the gospel. Yeah. And if everybody has a ministry to preach the gospel of Christ, he must be exemplary. Preaching the gospel already makes you an elder. If so every child everyone of God, must have one wife. Yes, if every child what of God... What about divorce? Divorce, it depends on domestic violence threat to life, sure it's allowed. Divorce is allowed? Yes, because... But double marriage is if, not allowed. Hold on. Divorce is allowed on conditions of threat to life. Okay? Because threat to life is no more marriage, it's persecution. Well, that's divorce on the base of violence. But divorce on the base of disagreements is not violence. It's well, disagreement. Disag disagreement. Allegations again. of cheating. Well, allegations of teaching, there's forgiveness in the New Testament. So you will encourage the I'll, lady I'll or the man. I will encourage forgiveness. Both and parties. And the, the man, man says, my wife has cheated. Be you say, forgive her. Be subjected the woman to says, my husband has cheated. Forgive her. Don't leave the marriage. Galatians 6.1. If a man be overtaken in a fault, he that has spiritual restore such a one, the spirit of meekness. If he does it again. Well, if he does it again, that's where discipline comes from the church. You will discipline him? Yes, discipline By giving him what? Canes? Not. <laughs> there are other ways to discipline people in the house of God. There are LGBT. Ways. Homosexuals and lesbians. It's always been there from the days of Noah. Are they evil? They are not evil. They are just people suffering from identity crisis. They need to be shown Christ. If they see Christ, we all with open face, beholding the glory of God as in a mirror, we are changed into that same image. So we don't beat them down. We don't condemn them. We don't destroy them. We just show them who they are in the light of Scripture. Should we pass laws to tell them that what their practice is wrong? Well, it depends on what the government decides to do in any nation. But as a church of God, our job is to reconcile them with Christ through the preaching of the gospel. And the gospel has power to free them from that. If one identity. of your pastors came to see you that he has discovered himself that he is gay, and that he, he really wants to live as gay, but he loves the Lord. I can boldly say none of my pastors who do that because I feed them Christ. If a pastor somewhere else sees you, a Bildamina, I want you to help me. I'm gay, but I love the Lord. There I are have, gay bishops in England. It will shock you to know I have a lot of gays who have thrown it away because they came to the realization of who they are. Gays, lesbians. Yeah. They told you they were lesbians? Yes. And you counseled them away? No, they just kept following what we teach. And suddenly they discovered who they were in Christ. And that desire left. It's identity crisis. You never know who you are till you know who Jesus is. As long as you don't see Jesus, you will have identity crisis. Is God interested in football matches? No, why? I'm asking. 
They no, said he, God rules in the affairs of men. No. Is he interested in Real Madrid versus Barcelona? No, God is not interested in... Those are within, he doesn't care who wins. Those are within men now. Those are But when they say God is interested in the affairs of men, what God does it mean? Is, God is interested in the affairs of men simply means God loves men and he has set the planet in a way men can conduct their lives. That's simply... So if I'm supporting Barcelona and I fast and pray that Barcelona beats Real Madrid... So what if I am supporting Real Madrid and I fast four days and pray that Real Madrid... That's why God makes the determination. No, God doesn't. So both of our fasting and prayer is useless. We wasted our time. Really? Total waste. In the waste. affairs of men. Total waste. If Barcelona is my business and I pray to God that, that my business may succeed, Holy Father, help me that I can win the title. No, it will not succeed if you don't do your due diligence. So no, I have to win. You raise your people. You yeah, we we'll do people. all we have to do, but we still believe that as men we are limited. Competition. God among, can always come in. Competition to, among men. The rules are set by men, not by God. It's so. And it is determined God is higher. and judged by men. But God is higher. It's like saying God is not happy you wore. Uh, Why did David pray to God for the battles he fought? Why didn't he train? Just well, go and fight the battle well, again, and win. Those are things we need time to explain. Oh, time. They okay. Are not, they are not. <laughs> okay. We'll have to come to Nigeria and visit with you and do <laughs> that this. That would be very good. All over again. And, that would be uh, very, very good. We'd like to end this at this stage. Unless you have a message for our viewers. Well, the revelation of Jesus simply means that the whole Bible is Jesus. Old Testament, Jesus concealed. New Testament, Jesus revealed. All the issues we have discussed today, they'll be very easy if you see the Bible in the light of Christ. John 5, 39, Jesus said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but the scriptures testify of me. So the Bible is the message of Christ. Now, once you see the Bible in the light of Christ, all these concepts we are discussing, they become easy for you to understand them. You've got to see that it is Christ-centered. In the book of Luke 24, 25, when Jesus rose from the dead, after three days, the Bible says he met two gentlemen going to Emmaus, and they were discussing the event of the past three days. And they were wondering why Jesus had to die because they thought he was a martyr. And Jesus was among them. And they were preaching Jesus to Jesus, but they didn't know who Jesus was. And Jesus said to them, O fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and all the prophets? He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The entire message of the Bible is the revelation of Christ and him glorified. Once you see Jesus, you see yourself. If you can't see Jesus, you'll be a victim of identity crisis. So it will take the revelation of Jesus to unveil the believer in Christ Jesus. That's how to look at the scriptures using the lenses of Christ and his finished work.